you. My name is Sanima Sandberg, and I'm a PhD student at the IT University of Copenhagen, where I'm a member of the Technologies and Practice Research Group. And my work is on the sort of social infrastructure of digital payments, as some might call it, which is looking at the people and networks that enable technical implementation. So I look at use of technology and how technology affects social and economic relationships. And this talk is going to briefly, very briefly, cover some findings from a recent research project on digital payments in Indonesia. So find me if you want to hear more about it. So for context, at DEF CON and generally in the blockchain community, we talk a lot about onboarding users, finding use cases, why don't people use crypto? And ideally, I mean, users will even know that they're using crypto at the end of the day. And so this talk focuses on commercial platforms, or in particular, proprietary platform, and looks into how users are actually interacting with um, this mainstream digital wallet, specifically digital wallet that emerged relatively recently. Um, and specifically, I am interested in the relationships between the intermediaries that emerge in that space and the potential peers of what we refer to as peer-to-peer -peer payments. So my research took place in Indonesia, which has a population of over 260 million people, and currently, with the newly re-elected president, a very specific profile about increasing digitalization, or what he refers to as Indonesia 4.0. Ring any bells or sound familiar? Yes. So there's this growing uh, emphasis on e-commerce and digital platforms. So what does a digital payment look like in Indonesia? Well, fragmented infrastructures for connectivity and the deregulation of the telecommunications industry has led to a really rapid uptake of mobile phones because they're both more convenient and more affordable than traditional landlines. 80% of internet users are accessing the internet by using their smartphones or tablets, which is kind of a problematic thing since even though many people have mobile phones, less than half have a smartphone, which tells you something about who is and who is not accessing the internet. Many of those who do access the internet are also doing so with um, allocated gigabytes that are mainly uh, targeting social media. So for example, uh, Facebook users, surveys have come out showing that many people who are using Facebook don't even realize they're using the internet, which is something to think about when we talk about things like Libra coming out. An important side to that is that many of my informants pointed out that even though they can explain to me in detail why mobile payments are awesome, they don't actually use them because their smartphones are such low quality smartphones that they simply don't have enough space for more than one payment app. And they would much rather prioritize their social media apps and all the photographs they need for Instagram. So infrastructures of payment are also quite fragmented and have a huge lack of interoperability. So here, in a regular supermarket, you see seven different card readers. Five are from five different banks, and two of them are for mobile-based payments. Less than half of the Indonesian population has access to formal financial services, and that includes infrastructure such as ATMs, so the ability to actually get cash in your local community. Um, and of those, only an estimated 11% of account holders have debit cards, so systems like this are still for the relatively few. Um, low access to conventional financial services and increasing use of smartphones means that digital payments bridge a really important infrastructural gap for many people. So, this is why we've seen this rapid growth of digital payments in Indonesia, and particularly this app, Gojek, which is Indonesia's first unicorn, for which they can in part thank uh, Google's reputed $1 million donation. Um, so, apps like these allow users to top up their infrastructure with cash, uh, add a designated agent, and then they can use that app to make a digital transaction in a specific situation, so what many of us would use a debit card for. These bridge this important infrastructural gap and provide a sort of proxy banking or banking light feature in people's lives, something that you can upgrade with to get more features, such as, for example, the ability to cash out again or send money to your friends. Um, so this particular app started as a scooter hailing service, like a call-in and someone will come and pick you up, and in 2015 formalized as an app. And in 2017, it developed this um, built-in wallet, which now bridges an entire ecosystem of apps that range from go car to go food to go massage, all of which you can pay inside the app using their wallet. And the wallet, of course, is called GoPay, just so we're all clear. So, where am I coming out with this? Well, I've heard it said a lot of times here that technology is not a neutral artifact. We shape it, and it shapes us. 
And the aspirations of technologies creators tend to be implementing the apps or other technologies that we make. So forms of money also convey meanings, and they tell us how we make our communities. And this, I think, is a pretty familiar thought or ethic when we talk in the Ethereum community. It also means that nodes of money, mobile money transactions cannot be considered, considered as isolated individuals. Decisions we make about our purchasing and our money behavior are not context-free. They are affected by external influences. So, what does Gojek tell us about the communities we live in, or the ones that they imagine us to live in? This is a stills from an ad that they released in 2016. It's an advertisement uh, that was made in the context of Ramadan. So it starts with a young girl and her mom. Her mom is a single mother, and she's working for this app. There's multiple clips. She's driving to and fro. Oh, she's, she's left her daughter in the morning and said, I'll see you when we're the class, when she gets her little package. So she's driving around all day. It's really hot. Passengers are cranky. They're rude. And then the final passenger is taking food to an orphanage. And as the driver watches the happy children, she smiles. Meanwhile, her daughter home opens the gift alone. And inside, there's a card from her mother explaining that she can't be home to break the fast because she has to make sure everyone else gets home in time to break the fast. Finally, as she breaks the fast alone on the side of a road with a glass of water, she starts to receive messages through the app from happy customers thanking her for her hard work and giving her a lot of ratings. So the app presents two categories of intended users. There's the service provider and the service user. Secondly, the company itself is hardly <coughs> present. The role as intermediary only appearing with the phones at the very end of the advertisement. Emphasis is on users helping each other out through the sense of social responsibility rewarded by their thankful peers. The ad presents a specific social understanding of the idealized user performing centralized social infrastructural roles while minimizing the role of the company in governing those interactions within the app. And these interactions are often being referred to increasingly as being peer-to-peer, -peer, or P2P. So I would argue that two in this context is much more than just a directional message. It's not just from peer to peer. It's also a placeholder for this intermediary company. And I would argue that the P's actually become a really inadequate signifier for different types of user categories. So originally a technical term, P2P, describing computers sharing files without a central server. Now it's increasingly seeing use and gaining traction in a wide range of socioeconomic activity. Remittances, lending, blockchain, and of course digital wallets using proprietary infrastructure, governed in fact by central intermediaries, such as Gojek. In a social context, when we use the word peer, we associate it with some sense of socioeconomic equality, something that the ad, for example, leans heavily into. And this, I would argue, is not really an accurate representation of the relationship between the supposed peers uh, that this app is trying to connect. So maybe more like this. The socioeconomic, oh, so yeah, finally, socioeconomically, the two in the P2P represents the relationship that the peer has to the company. Um, so not only do they have a relationship to each other, but they also have a relationship to the two. So when I asked drivers in Indonesia about their relationship to the company, the drivers would explain to me that they are mita, meaning partners. And during a focus group, one of the drivers interrupted to say, but we've never met, just to be clear. And this relationship between driver and intermediary is not in fact the equal partnership as they like to play with their publication material. It, for the company, it is the transactions made by the customer that are profitable. And thus, the drivers become tools to provide customers with these services. So in contrast to the idealized advertisement, an examination of the app itself reveals how specific mechanisms and interfaces, in fact, deliberately skew the relationship between the potential peers towards a configured inequality. There's incentivizing drivers to maximize tips in the first one, and these um, incentive tiers where they can achieve bonuses are called bonuses, but are in fact a really important element of the daily income, otherwise it wouldn't be a sustainable job. So it's completely um, compulsory to reach them every day. Passengers rate drivers, so what is a question of millimeters for my thumb to slide upon can be the difference between continuing a job and being banned from the app if you, for example, get a one star. Um, Rating. The app also sets routes of price, and because of the mechanisms employed, they have few seconds to decide whether or not to accept them. So drivers don't really have a chance to make an active decision about it. And in one case, one person pointed out, because my smartphone is so crap, 
this interface goes beyond where I can even see where the room is going, so I have to click before I know where this is going or how much I'm going to make on it. Finally, cancellations. Drivers can maximum cancel 25% of orders or they don't lose their, their daily bonus. This means that drivers typically will ask a customer to cancel if they really don't want to take the trip, which is fine. The app then introduces a new button going, hey, did the driver ask you to cancel when you're trying to cancel? That, and it turns out, of course, if you click it, they will be suspended. It doesn't tell you that, but they will be suspended. They later on evolved that even further to this entire uh, list of pictograms, which say everything from, I can't reach the driver, the driver's really far away, um, have, you know, a whole variety of different options for you to cancel with, and basically a minefield of unknowable consequences between you and the driver. So not only does the use of the term P2P conceal these embedded inequalities, but it obfuscates the role of the two in defining the terms of the relationship between these user groups. So, it's important to stress that users of an app are seldom passive consumers. There are many examples of resistance um, to these app mechanisms. I'll tell you a brief story about one of my informants. His brother died and he went back to visit his village to be a participant in the funeral arrangements. When he came back to Jogja, where my research took place, he turned on his app and he found that he wasn't receiving any orders. And after driving around an entire day receiving no orders, he called customer service and they told him there's no problem. The system's working just fine. Please carry on. And after about 20 days of this, he finally uh, gave up and sold his account for all of 85 US dollars. This was a pretty cheap account because at the moment it wasn't receiving any orders, but also it was in his dead brother's name, which means he wasn't able to change the affiliated bank account and he also had to sell his ATM card to go with it so that the other person would be able to extract digital earnings. Months later, um, he recounted to me that the buyer had gotten in touch with him to let him know that he'd finally managed to resuscitate the account, meaning it was finally receiving orders again. The buyer had given the account what they call therapy and gradually nursed it back to health. Um, so account therapy is this term used by drivers to describe a variety of practices deployed to train the algorithms that govern order distribution on the platform. So therapy is a form of intervention, but it's also a continuing practice since maintaining the vitality of your account becomes a necessary part of the job when your job is governed algorithmically. So, aside from the relationship brokered by the app, customers and drivers work together to co-op the platform in a sort of informal arrangement. They make trips offline, so the drivers can avoid the 20% cut that the app takes on all trips. They make additional bookings so drivers can reach that last point tier that they need to get their daily um, bonus. They buy drinks for drivers when drivers are waiting to take their order to get their order because drivers have to sit in line while the food is being prepared. So often it'll come with like a buy yourself a coffee. Um, and there's kind of an interesting enactment of this peer code that doesn't materialize in the app itself. So these are all strategies to make surviving within these proprietary platforms viable, maintaining a kind of flexibility within this imposed digital rigidity. Beyond the fact that there is this sort of inherent inequality here, there's also, it's also important to stress that these two peer groups are not monolithic categories. So not all peers on either side are equal. There are multiple inequalities within those groups as well. So not all drivers have equal conditions for participation, maybe lacking documentation or a bank account. So many of them will rely on third parties called it, uh, vendors. So vendors are a semi-formal agreement with the app company and they allow drivers that uh, are unable to register with the main platform for various reasons to get access to an online account. And one vendor like this can have a fleet of up to 1,000 drivers and they take a cut of between 5 to 30 percent, ranging on depending on what kind of vendor it is. They also store all driver data in an elaborate spreadsheet and then at the end of the day manually make a bank transfer from that account to the driver's bank account. Um, or alternatively, if you don't have a bank account, you can make a call and then the cash will be there in three hours so you can come pick it up. Aside from this, drivers are often members of communities or colonies which facilitate communication about how to access accounts. Um, so this is the biggest community in Georgia, which has over a thousand members. And here you pay for your membership sticker. Um, sometimes it'll collect money for different like, development projects like building this base camp or for members in need or struggling for whatever reason. They broker deals between driver services, such as car repairs, so that everyone will get a deal on how to access these kinds of services. They show up in person to help out if they have an accident by communicating extensively through WhatsApp communication groups. 
They also do outreach if passengers have forgotten things in cars because they're really afraid of getting bad reviews, for example, being accused of stealing something. Um, and of course, they're a marketplace for account trading, um, even though they're woe to admit it. Um, and this particular head of this community even talked to me about making their own payment system when they eventually upgraded from stickers to uh, membership cards so that they'd be able to connect all of these services that they'd now organized for themselves. The picture gets muddied even further on the other side. So also people who are using the services um, via their apps are not equal. So people who don't have smartphones or for whatever other reason are not accessing these accounts or rely on family or friends and strangers to provide access to the platform. As mentioned, um, not everyone has access to the infrastructure, so I talk to multiple people who don't have Wi-Fi at home. So they will rely on going to um, public access points for getting Wi-Fi so they can make bookings, but also to charging stations such as this one. And many of my informants, you know, would share their phones, share their accounts, their cars, pins, and many of their other resources that they're using these apps to access. And an example happened to me myself when I was trying to register in Indonesia. I just changed the law, I couldn't get a SIM card, and so I found myself in a really frustrating situation of not being able to get a SIM card because I only had a passport with me that was foreign. No problem, says the guy I found her. I'll register you my name. No big deal. Okay, so I got a SIM card registered in the stranger's family card ID because they can have up to three, which is great if you have kids because that's a lot of SIM cards you can register. One and a half months later, my access completely denied because apparently he found someone else that he wanted to give that number to. So, both service users and service providers rely on agents to facilitate cashing in and cashing out. So agents, there are several ways to cash in and out. Um, you can make a transfer at an ATM if you've connected your account to the bank. You can go to the local mini mart and pay a fee. And alternatively, the driver fleets themselves operate as agents that sell the digital balance for cash. Um, and money there ends up circulating according to the incentive schemes that the app provides. So in one model, Gojek, drivers will get if they sell 100,000 rupiah, which means they have to have minimum 200,000 rupiah available each day to make the point viable. This means that if you ask for less than that, they're probably not going to sell it to you. In the other system, they are given a 20% cash back on whatever they sell you, meaning drivers are going to be really quick to be like, hey, would you like 100,000? In which case, you should usually say yes. Um, one driver also showed me how he had managed to connect his bank account with his app using this, what he called his digital token. And basically what he had done was enable himself to always have access to money on his phone meaning he had converted himself into sort of a mobile digital ATM for users, but also he had converted his customers into cash ATMs for himself because drivers need cash to pay for fuel and for food and all the other things that these proprietary apps don't actually give them access to. So, all of this and P2P transactions. On the surface, digital transactions, transactions end up seeming sort of streamlined or clean the messiness of the cash exchange replaced and confined to the affordances of the user interface and the terms and conditions set by the companies providing the platform. However, the exchange of digital money is about far more than the financial transaction itself and contains much more than can be summarized in an elegant acronym. And this raises questions about how all of that inherent messiness will fit into seamless ideas about immutable ledgers, disintermediation, and trustlessness, all of which are heavily a part of this. To summarize briefly, because I think it's time to conclude, a few key takeaways. Intermediaries configure the relationships between users, so configure for pure good, not the opposite. Access is not a binary nor a static category, so contexts are not universal, so you have to consider the lived experiences of the people you're building for. Um, people will find ways to access the things that they need, uh, however many intermediaries it's going to take. So, success should be defined in terms of people's actual use, not the designer's intent. So technologies that don't interface with existing infrastructure will be repurposed and appropriated to meet the real needs of users to address the problems that they themselves define. And finally, given all of that, the thing that would be most critical for the people in this case study, support the flexible transition between digital and tangible forms of money, rather than necessarily talking about the elimination of cash or um, yeah, the idea of living in a cashless society. So, that's my 20 minutes. 
this was a very brief presentation of what I'm working on. Please come and talk to me if you thought it was interesting. And yeah, thanks for your time.